Okay, let's get started. Today's study tip says do weekly reviews. Once a week, skim through earlier parts of the course to refresh your memory and seek connections. Although our final is not cumulative, you say yay. Yay! This will help you put together the entire body and all of its components from cells to tissues to systems. This is good to do. Look over the old stuff. I know you don't have to look at it again, but it would be good for you to review the neurons, right? Osmosis, all that stuff. Still important to keep because uh, we're going to use it even though we're not going to officially be tested on it. Muscular System Part 2, Chapter 12. Today is uh, full of short stories. No big step thing today. So that's good. But lots to cover still. Muscle fiber, remember that's the muscle cell, is either on or off during a contraction. And the strength, which we measure as tension, or um, during the frog uh, physio -X experiment, you measure strength as force, also measured as the units are grams. Okay, so the force depends on the number of cross bridges that are made, and that's the myosin head and actin getting together and binding, and then the pull, the power stroke, right? This is a motor unit. A motor unit is a motor neuron and the muscle fiber that it innervates. That's the word for like a nerve touching something, innervate. So here's coming from the spinal cord, one motor neuron, and then at the end it splits to several motor um, end plates and touching, say, this one at the bottom, touching one to three fibers. Okay, so this is called a motor unit. It's the neuron and the fibers that it innervates. And you can see it could talk to three, it could talk to ten, it could talk to a hundred. So the more strength you need, the more fibers you need to turn on. That makes sense, right? To increase tension or strength of the contraction, you must recruit. That means bring on more fibers. A motor unit is one motor neuron and the fiber it commands. And for fine motor control, you have a high ratio like one neuron to ten fibers. And for gross motor control, you have a low ratio, like one neuron to 1,000 fibers. So this is um, fine motor, like writing with your hand, moving your fingers. Fine motor control, this is always something that for child development. Uh, can the child pick up the raisin? And, you know, little kids can't pick up little things. They can only grasp with all their hands. They're big chunky things and then as they get fine motor control they can pick up smaller things. Of course the child can't write, right? They kind of grab a crayon and draw, you know, but they can't really write. Gross motor, walking, um, talking however is fine motor. So think of all the things that little kids, little toddlers can't do. Those are usually fine motor things. So you don't need fine motor or a uh, lot of control for gross motor you can tell the whole leg, you know, contract, but for speaking, writing, you want to have um, a high ratio. Okay, to prevent fatigue, we have asynchronous, out of sync recruitment of motor units. So while some fibers are on, others are off. That makes sense, right? Because you don't want to get that lactic acid buildup. You don't want the muscle to just fall. So you got to hold it, hold it, hold it to prevent fat fatigue. And during maximal tension, you need all motor units to be on. This is unlikely something that you've had happen, even if you, you know, go to the gym and you say, I'm going to lift all this weight, yeah. You still can't do it unless there's, you know, full sympathetic nervous system stimulation. So these are the stories, you know, where the mother picks up the car off of the child, okay? True. Totally true. She picks it up pulls the kid out from underneath. Amazing stories of strength. All those stories are true, And but the mother, if you asked her to go back and lift up the car again, she couldn't do it. Because unless she has that rush, the epinephrine, every motor unit turning on, she couldn't show that strength again. Do you have any stories? Some of you might think you have one. Energy requirements. Look at that little battery. He's cute. The need for ATP is one, we know, to allow detachment of myosin. Two, 
we have to, when we're done with the contraction, we have to put that calcium back into the SR, right? So that is going um, against the concentration gradient. That's active transport, so we have ATP needed. However, as you know, just like a car, we are very inefficient and we waste a lot of our energy as heat, right? So when you start your car and you come back into the driveway after running around town, you, you know the hood of your car is hot, right? So that's why, because we're, uh, we're like an engine, we're not very efficient. We use the energy as heat to keep us warm, okay? So that is efficient, but um, considered wasted, actually. Sources of ATP um, from rest, we make ATP, and then any extra is converted to something called creatine phosphate. And what we do um, is when there's a contraction, we use the ATP that we have, and then any more that we need, we can make through the whole citric acid cycle, you know, electron transport system. But prior to that, there's one, one trick you can do, and that's to have the body use the phosphate from this creatine phosphate that we made earlier, add it to ADP to make ATP. So it's super fast ATP, because usually in the mitochondria it takes a long time, not long in terms of you know days, but it takes a long time in terms of milliseconds to make the ATP from scratch. Okay, it's glycolysis, citric acid cycle, electron transport system. As you know, there's lots of steps involved in that, and that takes a long time. So ATP that you have plus the creatine phosphate, of which we're going to take the phosphate and add it to ADP, will give us more ATP. For about 30 seconds, I've seen 20 um, in other sources. Pretty much the time, like if you watch the Olympics, you'll see the sprinters go really fast, a 50 meter dash. They run super duper 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 fast. And you'll see them start to kind of slow at about 20 seconds. That's kind of it. That's all we have for instant energy. So to make more ATP, you're going to use the mitochondria. All right. This is another picture that we've seen before, reminding us about tetanus. So it says, recall tetanus was we shock. Um, we have incomplete tetanus, and that's when we we add a stimulus and then the muscle relaxes and it contracts and relaxes and contracts and relaxes. If we increase the shocks per second, you get less of that relaxing. And then I told you that that's really not going to help us hold our textbook or something, right? This would be shaky. So what we need is, say, 60 shocks per second, which is from our brain sending the shocks, right? Sending the signal so we get complete tetanus. What I wanted to talk about now is if you hold, 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 like right now, if you go lean against the door with your back against the door, bend your legs like a chair shape, you hold it like a chair, and then slowly your back will fall down the wall, and you get fatigue in your quadriceps, right, in your legs. So you know what fatigue is. You don't see it very often because usually you stop doing whatever it is that makes you fatigue. But these are the things that happen during fatigue. This lady, by the way, does not look very fatigued to me. <laughs> All motor units are in use, maximum force. It is uh, due to an accumulation of extracellular potassium. So remember, potassium is going to leave, right, when we open channels. There's a loss of glycogen. So if you hold, you know, that chair shape, chair exercise against the wall, your body will use the ATP, the creatine phosphate, then it will start to use the glycogen to make ATP and eventually get loss of that. And of course, the lactic acid buildup, that's what you feel in your legs and that's the burn, and then you just fall down. Physical conditioning. Look at this guy. He's all lumpy. Um, two types of conditioning I want to talk about. One is called anaerobic endurance. The other is called aerobic endurance, right? So this one, anaerobic endurance is short bursts of energy, which um, sprinting would be one, weightlifting would be another, tennis is an example where you run one way, stop, run another way, stop, run, stop. Um, these encourage the body to enlarge 
muscles. And when it does that, it gets the, your muscles get bigger when you lift weights, right? Because it's adding more actins and myosins, more myofibrils, to the um, muscle cell. So one muscle cell doesn't divide. Instead, what it does, it just adds more actins and myosins, gets bigger and stronger, of course, because you have more power um, with all those cross bridges, right? This is called hypertrophy. So it's not hypertrophy, it's I try saying hypertrophy. What's the opposite of hypertrophy? Like if you put a cast on someone's leg and they can't walk on it for three months, take the cast off, it's all skinny. What's that called? It's called atrophy, right? Atrophy and hypertrophy. And of course, with all conditioning, if you don't use it, you lose it. So if you stop working out and you you don't get to the gym, you don't lift the weights, your muscles will go back to normal size again. Aerobic endurance. These are swimming, running, um, aerobic class, bicycling. All of these build up an oxygen debt. And although you feel like when you sprint or lift weights, you know, I'm lifting weights, you feel an oxygen debt. It's really not a long-term oxygen debt like running, bicycling, swimming, even walking. And what happens during aerobic endurance is your body wants to compensate and to fix the problem. And instead of getting bigger muscles, it's going to increase the number of capillaries to the muscle. So it will build capillaries. Like It'll say, hey, you know, every day she goes running for 15 minutes and apparently this is the new thing, so we better build some capillaries to go out to that muscle and deliver the oxygen and remove the waste. And then next week you'll find you can run 20 minutes and your body's like, oh, now she's running 20 minutes, got to build more capillaries. And then 25, you see, you could build up, right? 25, 30, next thing you know, you're running a half marathon. But... Then you sprain your ankle, hurt your leg, you stop running, you go back again after six weeks after you're healed and feeling good, can't do it, right? So the number of capillaries that grows can also be taken back. And this is an area of interest to people who study cancer and tumors because somehow those tumors are calling the body to supply blood to them. And if we understood how capillaries are told, you know, the command to grow and the command to recede, to not grow, to go back, um, perhaps we could stop blood flow to tumor cells. Interesting, huh? Okay, here's your group question. It says, Philip is a thin, tall, 29-year-old man. He wants to get bigger muscles, most likely due to societal influences on the physique of men. Okay, so we want our men to be bigger muscles, and we want our ladies to be skinny. Okay, you don't have to be bigger muscles, and you don't have to be skinny. We like you just the way you are. The health food store he shops at recommends two supplements for his diet. One is called creatine, and one is protein powder. Describe why these products sound like they will boost his bodybuilding, and physiologically explain why Philip is actually wasting his money. Now, some students get kind of upset when I show this question. They get upset for a couple reasons. One, they buy this stuff. So the guys in class are like, hey, I like it. It works. Yeah. What do you mean I'm wasting my money? And then there's some ladies who say, my boyfriend uses this stuff. He's wasting his money. I told him he was. He didn't believe me. So... Sometimes this gets people in a little frenzy. So take a few minutes. Think about why these sell at GNC or someplace like that. Why they sound like they're going to help and how you could sell them. But why they actually are not really needed and what you could do instead. Okay? Take a break. Pause the show.
Okay, so the first one, creatine, sounds good, right? Because we just heard. What does creatine do? A creatine has a phosphate and it gives you instant energy, right? Creatine powder must give you uh, energy, right? So I have a student who swore by this, and I still have students who swear by this. And he brought me um, the list of um, contents, the ingredients, in his creatine. Okay? And it says, um, I have the list in my, in my notebook here. Let me read it to you. It says, ingredients, pharmaceutical grade dextrose. What's dextrose? Sugar. Mm -hmm. HPLC tested pure creatine monohydrate. Creatine. Taurine, which is amino acid. Citric acid. Natural and artificial flavors, calcium silicate. Calcium silicate is usually uh, to prevent. It's like you know that stuff that they put in your shoe box when you buy shoes. There's a little bag in it to prevent it from getting moist. Dipotassium phosphate, disodium phosphate, ascorbic acid, pharmaceutical grade alpha lipoic acid, magnesium phosphate, FDNC red 40. That's yuck. Artificial colors and chromium picolinate. Okay, so he swears that this stuff helps him. By the way, the student who gave me that list was really small and I could totally lift more than he could. <laughs> but the creatine, when you eat it, think about this, will it actually get to the muscle and get and give you what you need? I mean, will you eat creatine as a powder, apparently, red powder and have it get to your muscle. It has to go through your digestive system, into your bloodstream, through the capillaries of the blood, through the capillaries of the muscle, into uh, the sarcolemma, crosses into the sarcoplasm where it's going to actually have its effect. Unlikely. Unlikely. Creatine you can eat and you get it in food sources right? It's a normal thing to have, but it's unlikely that you can eat it and have it all of a sudden increased, uh, increase your energy. Protein powder, why would he take that? He would take that because he's building muscle, right? But and he's going to work out. He's got to work out. He can't just take the protein powder and not work out. So he's got to lift the weights. But really, how much muscle mass can you build in one hour of working out at the gym? Not a lot in one day. So just adding a little bit of extra protein in your diet by milk or dairy products or eggs, another egg for breakfast, another half of a piece of chicken for dinner, fish, anything. Just adding more protein in your diet. Of course, I don't eat meat, so I would add more beans and rice, right? More protein for veggies. Not a problem. All that extra protein powder just comes right out as a waste product. It's called urea. All right. So the student who took the creatine um, did not like this question. He told me that it gave him increased water weight. Water in his water mass. I don't know what do you call it. Water weight or water mass in his muscles and when he stops taking it he notices his muscles get smaller so he will not stop taking it. I said okay and I did have a student who took the protein powder he tried going off of it for two weeks after hearing this lecture and then he, he said it made no difference um, to have the protein powder in his muscle size. He continued his workout as usual and he brought me the protein powder big giant containers of it, 50 bucks. So save some money and it's so much better for your body to have real food than to have powders, okay, which are all made in a chemistry lab. So this is an article you can read. It talks about some of the dangers of taking creatine for kidney problems and such. So it's important to, you know, look at all the things you're taking. Nothing, of course, don't do anything extreme whatever you do. Even vitamins, right? You can have too much of that. Alright, two forces in contraction. Active force 
and the passive force. So the active force is when myosin and actin bind, make a power stroke. Normally it's the only force used in a muscle. The passive force though is what we see in the frog physio X experiment where we take the frog muscle, we pull it, take it out of the body, right? We dissect it and we pull it beyond its active force so that you see the stretchy behavior of tendons and connective tissue, the elastic fibers inside of the muscle make it kind of bounce back like a rubber band. So this is only seen experimentally. You wouldn't see this normally. Normally when you're, if you extend your arm right now, you'll see that your arm has a joint and that stops it from going too far. So even if you hyperextend your arm, you're still only going to see the active force in real life. Passive force experimentally. Using your textbook, write the definition for the two terms, isotonic, isometric, then hold your heavy backpack or book at a 90 degree angle. Now lift it towards your shoulder. Which maneuver is isotonic, which is isometric? Okay, take a minute to do this. Okay, so isotonic means, iso means what? same tonic refers to tension same tension so when the tension is staying the same the muscle length is changing it could be getting shorter and it could be getting longer either one so don't just assume that contraction means the muscle cells are getting shorter because sometimes we're lengthening even though we're contracting so the isotonic is the same tension muscle length changing Isometric, iso means same, metric means measure. So the same measure means that the length is the same, but the tension or the force or grams, whatever you want to call it, the strength is changing. Okay, so the isometric is the same length, but the tension is changing. So now hold your backpack straight out to the side or your book, grab something, do it with me. Okay, hold it out. Hold it. Is that isotonic or isometric when you hold it? What's happening to the muscle length? Look at look at your bicep. Is it changing or staying the same? It's staying the same, right? So that's isometric. And when you lift your book towards your shoulder, the muscle length is getting short. Your bicep is shortening, right? So that's isotonic contraction. And then as you hold it at your shoulder, it's isometric. Uh -huh. and then set it back down again. As you go down, it's isotonic. Mm -hmm. So when you d do things all day, you do a combination, right? Isotonic, isometric, isotonic, but one, man one maneuver, you could usually separate it into the isotonic and isometric. This is called the length tension relationship in the muscle. Do you have an optimal length at which your muscle works and what the optimal length is this picture in the middle here where all of the little myosin heads are next to an actin and they can grab and they can pull this one over here on the left too short right uh, not enough uh, s space left to grab and pull we're almost at the end and then here the muscle is stretched too long and there's no overlap so this is looking at the uh, strength or tension and the percentage of uh, resting length so here's a hundred here's normal resting 100 to 120 percent of resting gives you the maximal tension so this this like if you wanted to um, say pick up a child pick up a little kid right you're not gonna uh, it's, say it's a three-year-old okay you're gonna actually lean over right to grab the kid and that's kind of putting in your arms are kind of bent right and your back is over that's the optimal um, length you naturally do it you don't think I am going to now bend over to have the optimal length right you just bend over and pick up the kid you wouldn't stand up straight and grab the kid I mean unless you wanted to have fun maybe but you know pick them up from their hands right and pull them up if you were straight and you wouldn't get on the ground to lift them up so that would be too short if you were on the ground, too tall if you don't bend over. So your body naturally has this happen, okay? It's not brilliant here. It's called the length tension 
relationship. You want every actinomycin to be overlapped to give you the most you can. So too short, you get an overlap of myosin and actin. Too long, the myosin heads do not have access to actin, and the optimal length gives the maximum force possible and all myosin heads can interact with actin. Fun fact, your muscles do not grow during exercise. Exercise is only the stimulus. The body strengthens the muscles while you are resting. Okay, muscle fiber types. We have fast fibers and slow fibers. Fast fibers are large in diameter. Slow fibers are about half the size of fast ones. High density of myofibrils versus slow fibers which have more capillaries. Okay, so one is for strength and the other is for and for long term, right, to have capillaries, you would, it would be able to go a long time. So um, lots of sarcomeres in the fast fibers, they're very powerful, whereas myoglobin has, is, is seen in the slow fibers, so they are going to hold more oxygen. This also changes the color of the fibers. If you look at the fast fibers, they're more whitish color, whereas the um, slow fibers <coughs> are red in color because of the myoglobin and all the capillaries. And they fast fibers fatigue quickly, so they're just for power, fast, whereas slow fibers are good for long contractions. And then the example we give is the chicken breast, the white meat, right? It is white. When you cook it, we call it white because it's white in color, and they are made of fast fibers, the chicken breast. It's for have you ever seen a chicken fly? I mean, they don't fly. Do they fly south for the winter? No, they just, like they go, like if a dog comes up to the chick to a chicken, it'll just go, and it'll just kind of fly, like five feet in the air, just kind of like a jump, a big jump, right? So they're not really meant for flying. So they do a good job, however, of walking all day. So the chicken leg, you know, that's, that's all they do is walk around and peck, eat, peck, 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 eat, eat, walk, walk. The chicken leg is um, the dark meat, we call it, right? So it's red in color, good for contractions. It's going to be all day walking around. Now, the now, difference in this is a duck. Have you ever had um, duck breast, eaten duck before? What color is the duck breast? It's brown, yeah, it's dark meat. And th that is because the ducks fly south for the winter, right? They f the ducks actually fly. And so the flying is going to be um, the slow fibers, right? They've got a long distance to go. They need all the capillaries. They're not going to be white in color, okay? As a vegetarian, I need to go eat some tofu now after all that chicken talk. I think we're done. Nice.